This is the new Mercedes-Benz S-Class, an iconic symbol of luxury and opulence. Today, we'll be driving the S580 model. Fingerprint readers are pretty common tech on our phones and computers, but having them in a car is quite interesting. You don't need it to operate the vehicle, but it allows you to access custom settings and sensitive information like your home address. To get things going, we'll pull down on the classic Mercedes stock shifter. Don't worry about the flashing purple lights, they seem to be IR illuminators that are naked to the human eye. You'll notice that there's quite a bit going on in here, and it's dramatically different than everything else in the current Mercedes lineup. The most obvious is that they did away with their dual panoramic displays. I'm not sure I like the new setup. It feels slightly less expensive to the eye, and it also eliminates a lot of physical switch gear, which I'm personally a fan of. The car is equipped with rear-wheel steering that has 4.5 degrees of articulation, and it really makes a difference because this is a long car. I think we're at about 208 inches with a 126-inch wheelbase, and that's basically mid-sized pickup truck territory. Yet with rear-wheel steering, it drives like my wife's old Mazda CX-3, which is a compact hatchback. This first section of road here isn't the best kept, and we'll tackle it in comfort mode. But remember, this is an S-Class, and its primary purpose is to make sure you have a pleasant riding experience. You can see it does rumble the camera as we go over some imperfections, but frankly, it's very, very composed. But there is a hint of stiffness buried somewhere in there. It's not as plush as some modern Lexus SUVs, but I'm splitting hairs at this point. Steering in this mode is also the right amount of stiff, and there's good feedback. The left side of the wheel controls your dashboard, and the right side controls the center console screen. Speaking of which, let's take a look at it. It's very responsive, even with gloves on. The screen is a high resolution that rivals the image quality of a modern iPad or tablet. The stock navigation is quite advanced. All the HVAC controls are also operated through the screen. It does have some haptic feedback, so it helps make the experience more satisfying. Your heated and vented seat controls are here on the side of the door. And despite the lack of physical controls in general, it's quite easy to access everything. Even though on paper the S-Class is quite a large car, it doesn't look that imposing, which in my opinion is actually a bad thing for a flagship. Despite being half a foot shorter, the previous Gen W222 S-Class arguably had more road presence and was able to differentiate itself from lesser models in the Pantheon. I think my biggest complaint, besides the fact that this car is white, is that it looks very much like an elongated A-Class sedan on steroids with some shinier MB bits. Call me silly, but I think this is one car that would have benefited from having a bigger front grille situation. But let's be real, S-Classes are meant to be enjoyed on the inside, so let's talk more about that. Now, inside the menu system, there's quite a bit of customization and info that is buried. If you scroll here, you can access your seat comfort settings, cabin preheat, customize your ambient lighting, and do some other fun stuff. The interior lighting is bright and really noticeable at night, so it's actually worth fiddling with. The LEDs are active, so they change colors when you adjust the temperature or alert you to vehicles in your blind spot. You can activate your seat kinetics and adjust your lumbar support here too. I'm a little annoyed because for some reason, every time I start the car, it forgets my settings and I have to reactivate the kinetics in the menu. The active side bolsters are not as aggressive as something you'd find in an AMG, but that's to be expected. This adjustable lumbar thing is super cool, and the haptic feedback on the screen makes it fun to play with as well. Most of this other stuff is pretty self-explanatory and you just have to go through it all. The dash and augmented reality heads-up display rely heavily on being able to see your eyes, so placement of the steering wheel is key. However, there's a massive camera where my head would be, so that's why it's freaking out. Just use the left side steering wheel controls to cancel the pop-up. We'll use the same controls to get access to different looking instrument clusters too. The road gets better up here, so we'll use physical drive mode switches to throw it into Sport Plus to see if this thing has any balls. The car changes its personality quite dramatically in Sport Plus. The steering gets more responsive, the suspension stiffens up a bit, and the engine note is significantly louder, but I'm betting that it's mostly piped into the cabin through speakers. It's definitely still not a sports car though. It's more like riding on a loud, thunderous cloud. It feels fast, but it's a floaty type of fast, a bit disconnected in both throttle and suspension feel. But the rear wheel steer really does make it more sporty than it looks. The radius and angle is a lot tighter than the wheelbase suggests for sure. In terms of throttle, you really need to be putting your foot down for it to give you the full package, otherwise it's still quite muted and tame. I'm actually not a huge fan of the Sport Cluster. It gives you revs, but no shift lights or any indication of when to change gears. It's only good for looking cool, I guess. 
The heated seats and armrests do get quite hot on the third setting, so let's turn them down. So you can press this button here for your augmented 3D surround view. Hit this and you can adjust your heads up display, turn the 3D dash on, and play with driver assistance functions. But for a modern luxury German car, the shift response is frankly a bit slow. The upshifts are okay, but the downshifts take forever to execute if you use the paddles. And if you are using the paddles, it'll kick you back into full auto within a few seconds, so it's really not that fun to use. I'm actually surprised that you're able to turn off stability control on an S-Class. Just doesn't seem like that kind of car, but good to know, I guess. Honestly, I feel like Sport Plus is already way more comfortable than most sports cars in comfort mode. The paddles themselves aren't bad, but they remind me a lot of the newer Audi RS paddles and less of the old Mercedes AMG ones that I really liked. In my opinion, it's a step backwards, but I'd imagine that anyone driving an S-Class wouldn't even bother using these. The car behaves much better in full auto anyway. The braking feel is also not up to par with the rest of the car. It's a little bit mushy, but I guess we'll find out for real when we do our performance tests later. Let's switch over to Eco Mode to save fuel and be more comfortable. And let's also use this fancy Maybach exclusive dash cluster. It changes the center display too, and it's really kind of nice. I dig the clean, fancy white look. Very executive looking. This driving mode combo feels a lot more appropriate for this kind of car. But surprisingly, even in eco mode, the car does get up and move. I mean, with a hair under 500 horsepower, it should still definitely be able to outpace most things on the street. Okay, so the one thing I was really curious about is the self-driving tech in the S-Class. They had this option in the previous generation, but I heard it wasn't that great. Our 2020 BMW X6 M50 also had level 2 plus autonomy, but it wasn't perfect either. And it would be quite annoying if you took your hands off the wheel for more than 5 seconds. So let's see how this Mercedes one does. You activate it on the wheel by pressing the active cruise button, and then hitting the upper set button. You can obviously change your distance settings as well. So in practice, it's definitely smarter than BMW system right now and less annoying. But at some point, it'll beep at you if you don't put your hands back on the wheel. Either way, like most systems today that aren't Tesla's autopilot, it's still not 100% there yet. It works okay on back roads if you have a car in front of you, but I would only feel fully comfortable with it on a highway. Everything else is pretty self-explanatory though. Like with most modern Mercedes, adjusting your seat is on the door panel. The window switches and lights are pretty easy to access as well. Other than having really cool tech and being comfy, the cabin is actually superbly quiet. It's got dual pane acoustic glass and we'll open the window here to listen to some outside noise. I really don't like the piano black trim in this car. It looks rich when it's clean, but frankly, it's a fingerprint and dust magnet. I personally would have opted for wood trim or something more matte in finish. I do like the lacquered steering wheel though. I really don't understand this traffic light camera that pops up anytime I'm at a stoplight. Does the car think I'm blind or something? Get out of here. 3D Dash is cool to see, and the heads-up display is really nifty on this car. You can customize it and also do augmented reality stuff. It's not as good at nighttime though, or maybe I just didn't set it up properly. I'm sure that with a car like this, there's endless customization possibilities buried somewhere in the menu system. There are a few other screens here that you can cycle through for info, but you can't swipe though. This one here is good for performance driving and it looks quite cool. 
This one is for tracking your fuel economy, which makes it completely useless for me. But I like the first one the best for general street driving. Android Auto and CarPlay have a pretty decent sized projection and they are wireless too, so that's nice that you don't have to have messy cables everywhere. There's 110 power in the backseat area and USB-C ports everywhere else for you to charge stuff. I still like looking at the stock GPS though because of the crisp graphics. Oh my god, this silly traffic light camera again. I'm gonna throw it back at the Swerve Plus because there are some nice curves coming up and I just like hearing something else besides my own breathing when I drive. We'll also switch back to the classic cluster. There's some more driving information that you can cycle through in the middle of the dash here. A lot of it isn't pertinent to me, so I'll just leave it on this little eco ball screen. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the point of this game is to make the ball as red as possible. Yeah, so I usually love driving cars in the sportiest drive modes, but in an S-Class it just doesn't feel right. This is 100% a Boulevard Cruiser or something you just get driven around in instead of driving yourself. Let's try out the self-park function. This was something that BMW really struggled with, but I'm pretty impressed at how Mercedes is implementing it. A little confusing at first, but once you get it, it works quite well. You just have to keep your foot pegged to the throttle to actually initiate the parking sequence. I'm still immensely enthused by the rear wheel steering. It really makes this car much more nimble than it should be. Then again, this is also the first car I've ever driven with this option, so I'm sure there are other good examples as well. I'm probably just missing out. Anyway, I think it's about time we wrap it up here and head over to the performance testing portion of this review. So, for those unfamiliar, we'll be running our usual half mile acceleration test down our runway and then testing the S-Class around some corners through our handling course. It's obviously not a performance car, but since this channel is all about performance, the question you should really be asking yourself is, why not? Anyway, let's get this party started. Correct me if I'm wrong, but since there's no obvious launch control, we're just gonna brake boost it. As mentioned earlier, the brakes aren't the greatest, so you really need to dig down deep for them to do their job. They were able to stop this 5,000 pound beast from 130, but I wouldn't say that it was done confidently at all. So the car crossed the half mile at 129 miles per hour because the top speed is factory limited. We were able to achieve a 6 to 130 time of 13.26 seconds through analyzing VBOX data. To see more times on this car, check out our fastest link in the description below. Anyway, time to do the handling test. Keep in mind that since this is a car that you would potentially get chauffeured in, We'll take it relatively easy and not gun for lap times.
But that's just a walkie-talkie flying around. But I'm really impressed by how nimble this thing is around these tight corners. I just don't trust the brakes past 100 miles per hour. The car posted an extremely modest lap time of 54.96 seconds, but to be fair, it's not made for this, and for the same reasons, we didn't push a 10 tenths. Anyway, at the end of the day, it's still a very impressive machine. Especially if you consider that its primary purpose isn't to be fast, but to be extremely comfortable. I don't even think that the 580 trim is necessary. If I were in the market for something like this, an S500 would do the job just fine. Because it's a better value, and 429 horses is plenty. Having a 4-liter twin-turbo V8 with the mild hybrid system making almost 500 brake horsepower is simply the cherry on top that I might never eat. But the selling point on this thing is the interior. When I first saw it, I was blown away. I'm always impressed by Mercedes cabins, but this was on a whole nother level. The stitching, the attention to detail, the materials used, it just screams absolute luxury. The tech also feels modern enough to be relevant for a generation or two. And don't even get me started in the back because you wouldn't want to drive anymore after sitting here. And if you really want luxury, you can get the long wheelbase for even more legroom. But I'm not a fan of the S-Class. Never really liked the idea of executive sedans. I only really appreciated the two-door version of the car. So when I found out that they were no longer making S-Class coupes, I was disappointed. They obviously have plans for an S73 AMG model, but I have to wonder, at this point, is it just overkill? Because though the car drives well for what it is, at this level, I would much rather enjoy being driven around in it. After spending a few days with the Benz, I am no longer doubting the updated interior. It is indeed a step forward and something that I could get used to in the future Mercedes design language. The S-Class is a great leap forward for MB, and even though it's at the pinnacle of the luxury sedan segment, it's not the car for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. If so, it'd be awesome if you can hit that like button and share the video with your friends. I can't cover everything I want to in the short amount of time that I have, so if I miss something, let me know in the comments below. As you probably know, it's mainly just me and my wife doing this channel in our spare time. So if you want to show your support, I'd really appreciate it if you took a look at our merch store, or maybe bought something through our Amazon affiliate links in the description below. And if this is your first time here, don't forget to check out some more videos on the channel. I produce all sorts of cinematic car content, so if you like what you see, Smash that subscribe button for new episodes whenever they come out. Thanks for watching.